Tēnā koutou e te iwi whānui en homai nei o tātou maraimaha. Tēnā koutou i ngā aitua o te wā. E oku hoa o te rōpu atu mataunga e mihi atu rā tēnei kia koutou katoa. Koutou ngā kanohi ora o tātou huamaha koe huri ki te pō. I tēnei wā mō rātou te honore, mō rātou te kororia. Nā reira, ko rātou ki a rātou, ko tātou ki a tātou, ki a ora hui hui tātou katoa. This is the story of the Māori Battalion, told through the experiences of five of our comrades. It cannot hope to be a complete record, but at least it tries to demonstrate the price which these young men were prepared to pay for the privileges of citizenship. It is a story about young people who, along with the other units of the New Zealand Division, contributed to the Division's fame. We hope that the young people of today can identify with some of the things which motivated the Ropu Atu Matawenga, the 28th Māori Battalion. E kore rātou e koro heketia, pēne i a tātou e ora nei. E kore te wā e whakaruruhi, ngā tau rā nei e whakakore i a rātou. I te uranga mai o te rā, a tainua ki tōna ngarotanga, ka maumahara tātou ki a rātou. Field Marshal, Rommel, Perua de Kauma Waru, Nata Matoa Atu Matawenga, Puta Noi Te Ao, Kavaka Tohia, Kavaka Tapua, Kavaka Noa, Tene Karaki Vaka Maharatanga, Irunga Te Inga Te Tokotoru Tapu, Te atua matua tō tātou keihanga, whakanohoia tō wairu tabukiru ki a rātou. Ata whai ti a rātou, manaki ti a rātou, ke putei tō rangatiratanga mutunga kore, ko iho kreit hoki tō mātou ariki. Amen. Rā nea tō. of Gloucester made an inspection of this later bunch of nails in a dictator's coffin. Among the troops inspected on this occasion were many Maoris, men whose destiny is linked with that of the whole British Commonwealth of Nations and who mean to keep it so. The march passed. It's hard to say which of the Empire's troops from overseas look best, but they're all good enough to prove better than any the enemy can produce. The Māori Battalion was a World War II infantry unit. It was made up entirely of volunteers as a result of efforts made by Māori parliamentarians and tribes. As part of the New Zealand Division, it saw action in Greece, Crete, North Africa and Italy. 
one of its most resolute but respected enemy leaders was Erwin Rommel. The Desert Fox considered New Zealanders to be the finest troops on the Allied side. Over three and a half thousand Māori soldiers fought for God, king and country. Two-thirds of them were wounded or killed, contributing to the most grim and final legacy of war. War was a frequent element in the lives of the many societies of ancient Polynesia. Competition and revenge for insults or grievances were the main causes of conflict. In New Zealand, the Maori refined their warlike heritage to take into account the climate and terrain of their new home. The people lived intimately with their environment. This way of life ensured that war was fought in harmony with the seasons, a time to draw sustenance from the land and a time to fight for it. From birth to old age, men were trained in the skills of warfare. There are no medals to record their deeds. Valor is commemorated in art. British and colonial troops found in the Māori a staunch adversary. Their physique, fitness, endurance and speed could not be bettered. Their shrewd military tactics so impressed the British that they recorded them and utilised them in wars from the Crimea to the Somme. These traditions of combat were passed down from generation to generation and were suddenly rekindled by a spark which ignited worldwide conflict. The Maori people were determined to play their part in their own way and began recruitment of a fighting unit ready to take up arms beside the Pākehā, their European counterparts. It was amazing the number of people who came along to volunteer their services. It was uh, some sort of a look forward to excitement, going abroad and this sort of thing. So they came in their hundreds in uh, the particular places we went to. On their horses, tie their horses outside, and one of my jobs was to drill them, give them sort of elementary training, and sort of standing at ease, up to attention, slope arm with a broomstick and this sort of thing. And that, that, that um, made them very, very happy. And of course they were faking their ages and how old are you? Oh, 21, some of them were 50. Uh, are you married? No. And they had about three or four children. You know, it, it, it was really amazing. <clears throat> there were six brothers in, in uh, my family, but it wasn't an isolated case. And there were many cases of Maori families who had uh, six and seven sons uh, that uh, went to the war. There were the uh, one-son families, and uh, that was very difficult. I was one of them, and uh, I had only there were only two of us in the family, a sister. And uh, the first thing my dad said when we were having tea, 
when New Zealand declared war against the Germans, he said, there's plenty of time. That's all he said, plenty of time. And I thought to myself, well, it's going to be hard, all right. And uh, I felt sorry for my mother. If I was to join, there'll be only two people left at home. However, when my friends started going to for medical and so on, I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to be left behind. And it was a hard decision to make to go to the to war. Strict training under superb Pākehā leaders commenced. An initial problem was with the World War I uniforms issued. Oh, no, Freddie Jones had to laugh. And he said, oh, well, of course, he said, um, those uh, uniforms are made under English uh, specifications, you see. <laughs> they were built for Englishmen, not for, for New Mar Zealanders. Marys. Or Marys in particular. <laughs> and you see these tight pants, <laughs> they, well, they couldn't hardly get their legs through them. And the, the sleeves were right down here, and the coats, Right down to the knees. <laughs> and they. Dad's army. <laughs> and they issued them with berries <laughs> to match. Oh, yeah, well, they looked terrible. Now, those boys had to turn around and um, um, spend uh, what little money they had to take them to some tailor and get them altered. And within a week or so, uh, they were looking quite smart again. In a deliberate move to ensure that the battalion be Māori in identity as well as name, it was divided into tribal companies. A company was made up of North Auckland tribes. B Company from Rotorua, Bay of Plenty, Taupo and the Coromandel. C Company comprised East Coast tribes, notably the Ngāti Paro and Rungo Whakata. D Company covered a wider area where there were fewer Māori. Waikato, Hawke's Bay, Taranaki, Wellington, the South Island, Chathams and Stewart Island. They parade again, 2,000 members of the 2nd New Zealand Expeditionary Force in Wellington before leaving for service overseas. For the second time in a quarter of a century, the manhood of the Dominion has heard and answered the call to imperial duty. So this is goodbye, good luck and a safe return. The ship, I suppose it was supposed to carry uh, about 2,000 people. And uh, when we left New Zealand, we had 4,000 troops. And it was hard on the men. As far as the officers were concerned, of course, we had the uh, deluxe uh, accommodation and dining room and cocktail rooms and so on. It hadn't been uh, changed in any way whatsoever. And it was a beautiful ship on top where the lounges were but not down below. It was too cramped. And uh, some of the men, of course, were below two decks, I think, below water level. And uh, I, whenever I was on duty, I didn't feel like going down to the bottom decks. You had to go down and see your men, and uh, the conditions weren't too good. The original destination of the troop ship Aquitania was Egypt, where training would commence with New Zealand soldiers of the first echelon already there. The racist policies of South Africa meant that, for the Maori, leave in Cape Town was limited. During their period in South Africa, the evacuation at Dunkirk took place. An invasion of England appeared imminent, and the convoy changed course from Egypt to Britain. Well, the main thing, I suppose, is the route march we had every day. We just about walked to England. Every day we went round and round the ship, and they, it was a big ship. And going round, like, oh boy, it's mighty long. We felt as if we walked to England. The relationship um, between the Parkers and, and Maoris was terrific. Um, they got along very, very well together, in all respect. In fact, um, Parkers, I think, were nearly as bad, if not worse, and, and then the Maoris were getting into mischief. 
think it was a normal relationship at home, you know? Yeah. Between the pile. There was no difference. As a matter of fact, uh, it was great. No difference whatsoever. Yeah. It was beautiful. We had, I think, about five senior nurses on. They were the only women on board. And uh, as time went on, you know, we were in the water six or eight weeks altogether, these nurses looked prettier and prettier as the journey, the journey continued. You better not say how. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, you know... This... June 1940, Gurok, Scotland. The Mari Battalion arrive in the United Kingdom keen to protect its shores from the Nazi threat. Another step on the great adventure that has caused many of them to leave their tribal homes 17,000 miles away. They bring with them their language, songs and cultural expressions of war, an easy marriage with the British traditions of army discipline. For the duration of the war, Reinforcements from New Zealand will keep the battalion's ranks filled with an average of 800 men, mostly young. We should do the same things as the other battalions. We didn't want to be mollycoddled or anything. Whatever they did, we had to do it too. And, uh, well, at the same time, I think we were feeling that we'll be better than them. There was, there was no tribal jealousy, was there, during the war? I don't think so. Uh, there was rivalry, yeah. friendly rivalry, but uh -huh. there wasn't jealousy. Yeah. Yeah. No. Or antagonism. No. no. Even competition among platoons, weren't there? Oh, yes. Amongst companies. I know mine, mine was the smartest in the A company. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the officer spent too much time <laughs> polishing his shoes and so on. He was always pick and spare. <laughs> remember Rangi Logan in charge of headquarters, training uh, headquarters uh, to, to beat the rest of the companies. And he was very, very disappointed the way they were drilling. And, and Rangi Logan said, if you had skirts, you'll be cheap mutton. <laughs> 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 Marching on to a parade, you see, the A Company would be, of course, first on the mark, and then B Company uh, uh, would march on again, because uh, when it, the orders to halt uh, were given, the, everybody was uh, uh, trying to put on a good show, and you hear A Company say, uh, <clears throat> under their breath, the penny divers. <laughs> So then C Company would march on, and you'd hear the uh, Rotru boys say, the cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> halt! C Company, halt! Ah, the cowboys. Oh. And of course, so long along the line. <laughs> Fears of an invasion of England diminished. In April of 41, the Maori were rushed from training in Egypt to assist in the defense of Greece. It was a catastrophe. The German forces and Luftwaffe overwhelmed them. Hopelessly outnumbered, they were forced to retreat from their first taste of combat. Attention immediately shifted south to the island of Crete. The battalion followed. The increased use of fighter planes and bombers in World War II meant that those who controlled Crete and her airports would have control too over much of the Mediterranean Sea. The gentle existence of the Cretan people would soon be ruptured by every violation that war could offer. Noch aber is England in besitz von Kreta. On the morning of the 20th of uh, May, 1941, we were sitting having breakfast under some wildwood trees just below this mound when we heard a continuous buzz from the sea. And we looked over and the sky was black on the horizon. It was the beginning of the invasion. It was a beautiful sight. And uh, 
because uh, it was something new, something unique to any warfare. We were dumbfounded and we looked at the planes in amazement more than anything else. When we got into our positions up here, the planes were flying almost level with the positions we had and so on, and we could see the doors open with the first parachutists ready to jump and so on, but they flew straight past us and we couldn't do anything about it, although they were close for any person to shoot at. But above us were fighter planes crisscrossing all the time, only 10 feet above us, so we couldn't do a thing. Soldier and historian Dan Davin later wrote, the sight was inexpressibly sinister, for each man dangling carried a death, his own, if not another's. Colonel George Dittmer was given instructions to counterattack. The battalion left their Platanias positions for the German-held areas to the west. As in Greece, confusion. Deadlines to begin the advance came and went. When the advance finally began, there was heavy opposition. They were very, very late. There were no tanks or air force support. Surrounded on land, strafed and bombed from the air, they carried on. So did the Germans. In kurzer Zeit ist der Flugplatz Malemes in deutscher Hand. The Maleme aerodrome was one of the key areas to the control of Crete. It was an open door for the German occupying army. This hill overlooking the Maleme tarmac was the Mari objective. If captured, no enemy plane would have been able to land. The door would be locked. Under heavy fire, they battled their way through dense vegetation, guided by a system of irrigation canals. The morning of the 22nd of May, we arrived above the aerodrome at Malimi and uh, had a good look at the aerodrome and uh, we spotted a few of the Germans walking around. So I turned around and borrowed the uh, brain gun of my, one of my boys. And I got down and prepared to fire. And as soon as I squeezed the trigger, something happened. A bullet, uh, a stray bullet or a bullet from a sharpshooter penetrated the barrel of my gun and split it open and so on. And bowled me over and there I was. And uh, the first thing I thought about was my mother at home. And then I saw stars, and I saw everything, and I thought, oh, this is beautiful. This is a lovely way of dying. <laughs> and, uh, however, I waited and waited, and then I recovered, I suppose. And I got, stood up, and I looked around. The boy who was firing beside me, he was firing with, with his rifle, and I thought he had struck me with the barrel of his rifle. However, he, he was still firing, and then I asked him, what happened? Did you hit me? And he looked up and he said, oh, he said, you were shot. Mind you, he didn't say it that way. He said a few words besides that. <coughs> and then I fell down again, and the blood started to pour. Prior to that, there was no, not a drop of blood. And then some of my boys rushed over and uh, bandaged my face and so on and uh, led me away to the uh, RAP. The attack failed. Orders came to withdraw. To prevent the exhausted soldiers being cut off by the enemy, the battalion were redeployed east of Hanya, away from the action, they thought. Then this is the direction of the uh, counterattack. Yes, we're right on it, I think. And uh, prior to this, I had just returned to the uh, battalion, but a uh, cousin came over to meet me, and we hid among some rushes because he had a can of 
fruit, preserved fruit. <laughs> Didn't want any of the other company boys to see us. And lo and behold, we didn't know that the Germans were quite close to where we were until we heard the burst of machine gun fire and uh, there it was. What was the reaction of the Germans when the uh, banner charge began? Well, the only thing they could do was to get as much shelter from the machine gun fire and so on. Mm. And they all got in behind these uh, olive trees, as you see. Because of the clear path in between the trees, they had to use one tree for 20 men or something yeah. in a scrummage formation. And after the, the attack was over, we had yeah. a look, oh boy. It's hard to imagine people still standing on their feet in a scrummage formation. Mm. They were so thick that they were held up by the density of their bodies. You know. German casualties were, were pretty heavy, so uh, our, our blokes must have got right into them. Well, I, I've seen one of my boys uh, charged with the bayonet, and the tip of the bayonet went right through. One of his friends was so close, he just touched the tip of the bayonet, touched his friend. Well, as you said, Don, uh, there'll be convulsions and I, I don't know what else. And uh, there's a heck of a lot of shock as far as the recipient <coughs> would be concerned. Yes. And, and, uh, well, many times mm. also, the, uh, um, when the bayonet went in, they had to uh, fire a, a, around ah, yes. from the rifle to mm. create the looseness to, mm. so they could get it out. Oh, in most cases, they just put their foot on the body of the, of the opponent and uh, jerk their rifle out. It's not so simple to pull it out because the muscles start to constrict. Mm. So, yeah. The 42nd Street bayonet charge drove the Germans back nearly a mile, killing over 80 of them. Among the victims were Cretans who had befriended the Maori and who had been used by the Germans as human shields. The battle for Crete was lost. The New Zealand and Australian men wearily trudged the mountainous route to Svaikia, where the Navy would evacuate them. The Germans were too late to prevent the escape, but found nearly 6,000 men left behind. There had not been enough room on board for everyone. The final ignominy of failure. It was terrible as far as we were concerned. Prior to deciding who we were going to say and so on, people were saying, well, you married, you go and so on. But the officers had the last word. We felt sad for them and they felt sad for us because they thought, well, we might get bombed anyway. But when we got on the ship, course, uh, we were so pleased to get away from Crete, we forgot the others until we got back to Alexandria. Η συνεισφορά των Γερμανών στη μάχη της Κρήτης ήταν πάρα πολύ μεγάλη. Μόνο να σκεφτεί κανείς ότι τόσες χιλιάδες μίλια μακριά από την πατρίδα τους ευρωθήκαν εδώ να πολεμήσουν μαζί μας. Δεν μπορεί να το περιγράψει δηλαδή κανείς πόση μεγάλη συνεισφορά μας έκαναν. Και ακόμα εδώ σε αυτή την περιοχή μπορώ να πω πως ήταν αποκλειστικά έργο δικό τους όλοι οι Γερμανοί που σκοτωθήκαν εδώ. Διότι οι δικοί μας δεν μπορούσαν να πλησιάσουν. Πολλά αεροπλάνα αυτοί βρεθήκαν εδώ, είχαν κλειστεί και όπλα εμείς δεν είχαμε μόνο από τις άκρες, μακριά από το αεροδρόμιο. Όλοι οι Γερμανοί που σκοτωθήκαν εδώ γύρω στην περιοχή οφείλεται εις τους νεοζηλαδούς που υποστηρίζανε το αεροδρόμιο και το ύψαμα τούτο. Ο πόλεμος γενικά είναι μια καταστροφή, ένα κακό πράγμα βέβαια. Αυτό οφείλεται εις τη μεγαλομανία και στα συμφέροντα των μεγάλων, των τρελών αποκλειστικώς, που σκοτώνονται άνθρωποι που δεν ξέρουν καλά καλά για ποιο σκοπό σκοτώνονται. Και εμείς είδαμε σε αυτό τον πόλεμο πάρα πολλά κακά γιατί και ολοκαυτώσεις και καταστροφές και μεγάλα πράγματα γίνηκαν. Εν πάση περιπτώσει, εμείς για άλλη μια φορά λέμε ότι η συμβολή των Ζηλαδών εδώ υπήρξε μεγάλη και εμείς τους θεωρούμε σαν αδέρφια μας. Εδώ αυτό της μάρτυρας ο αείμνηστος ο Πατεράκης ο Μανώλης ήρθε εδώ να ζητήξει βοήθεια από τα απέναντι ύψωμα 
και είδε τους νοσηλαδούς να πολεμούν με το φλασκί, το κρασί από τη μια μεριά να πίνουν και το όπλο να ρίχνουν στο λεξιτό θέση στην άλλη. Πολεμήσανε με θάρρος και άνδρια. Αλλά τι τα θέλεις, ο πόλεμος είναι μια καταστροφή. Η φήμη του τάγματος ήταν πολύ καλή, είχε δώσει σκληρές μάχες και εδώ και συνέχεια από, την, από το Μάλεμε μέχρι να έρθει εδώ πέρα. Σε αυτό το σημείο ήταν ίσως η τελευταία του μάχη και ήταν και αιματηρή μάχη. Το αποτέλεσμα φαίνεται από τους 320 Γερμανούς που σκοτωθήκαν αφού είχαν με τα χέρια, στα χέρια πιαστήκαν με τους Γερμανούς. Γίνεται μεγάλη τελετή Ανθρώπους. στον ομό Χανίων από τις αρχές, από το επίσημο κράτος στο οποίο λαβαίνει μέρος ο, όλος ο λαός γιατί πιστεύει ότι αυτοί οι άνθρωποι ήρθαν από εκεί από την, άκρη, από την άλλη άκρη του κόσμου και σκοτώθηκαν εδώ για την ελευθερία μας. Και εγώ προσωπικώ αισθάνομαι μεγάλη την υποχρέωση και κάθε χρόνο παρευρίσκομαι στο μνημόσυνο που γίνεται στο νεκροταφείο των συμμάχων, στο συμμαχικό νεκροταφείο της Σούδας που είναι θαμένη και η Μαόρη. Problems with communications, supplies and a vastly better organized foe contributed to the fiasco that was the bitter Greece-Crete campaign. First of all, I felt very embarrassed to think that um, here I am, a prisoner of war, all my voice um, taken over by someone else. And I thought, you know, um, I wondered how long I would be in captivity and uh, sort of feeling of being left behind by the left of the, of the, of the lands and um, sadness I suppose that you know, I, I wasn't quite sure whether I'll see any of my voice uh, again ever. Well, that was how I felt at that time. After two years in captivity at various prisoner of war camps, Hemi and a handful of other Maori were brought here to the Bavarian town of Eichstätt, to the camp Oflag Sieben B, the site of the district's police college. This is where I was 50 years ago. Hasn't changed much down there. Yes, our huts were down there. All the Maori boys were in the huts down there. Henaringata, Tengavangi, Anuridi. Anuridi. There was little point for Maori to even attempt escape. A brown skin marked them more clearly than any uniform. Better then to accept their position and wait for the war's end. All movements night and day were overseen by the guards, led by Hauptfeldwebel Hugo Zinzer. Auf der Kommandantur der Hauptfeldwebel dem unterstanden a ein Stab von 120 Offizieren, Verwaltungsbeamte, Abwehrleute und dann vor allem eine große Verwaltung. This camp, being an officer's camp, it was very, very heavily guarded. 
uh, many more guards than any other camp. And most of these fellows were fairly elderly. A lot of them um, were people who were sent back from Russia, and they had fur uh, no further use for them in the army as fighters. So they sent, sent them here as guards. Good day. Sie waren im Lager. You just said you were here as a prisoner. Mich wollen Sie nicht mehr kennen, wahrscheinlich. Ich bin nicht so viel mit den Gefangenen zusammen gewesen. He said it's difficult to remember you, your particular face, cause, but he was always with you all ah. for the whole time he was here. But let me please, first of all, introduce you. It's, uh, we'll start with the lady. This is Paula Walker. Yeah. This is the Gross Minister von Narimu, from the Zweiten Weltkrieg. Er hat die höchste Auszeichnung, the Victoria Cross, gewonnen. Yeah. And she is the Beiwahl Narimu, as er diese Auszeichnung gewonnen haben, ja. ist gefallen. Ja. Herr Zinser. Ja, Captain, schön. Das ist Captain Hemi Widemu. Ja. Das ja. ist Kenan Wee Huata. Ja. Er war ja. der Referent, ja. der Padre von der Maori Sie sind Italien in Sie Italien. Sind in, yes. in, ja. Engl in England. Äh, ne? In English. Der war der Padre, der Reverend für die Maori Battalion in Nordafrika, äh, in, in Italien. Italien. Ah. Und das ist Herr Zinser. Mm. He was Master Sergeant hier. And ah. as he said, the Indian Verde Commerce, the most important man in the camp. Ja, oh, yes. He <laughs> was the one who had to give the orders and pass them all on to you all. Ah, yes, and yes. This is Herr Strauss. Strauss. Okay. Herr Strauss, nice to meet you. He was here. Uh, wounded on the Russian front, uh, came mm. back and had the good luck, he said himself, to have been told you can stay here, and he was in charge of the post. Ah, yeah, yeah. Mm. 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 Yeah. Can you remember yeah. him uh, in, in, the, in, in the post office? He said no. before that he was uh, in charge of mm. having to sort out sometimes up to 3,000 pieces of uh, mail yeah. a week. All I, all I can remember is that all the letters I got, half of it was blacked out. The English letters. I can only remember that from the most of the briefs that I had held, half of it was with white curly. That's how we need them all. He said, he said, he said <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> Tell him that. Uh, <clears throat> The only letters they, they didn't black out were the Maori ones because they can't um, translate them. Er hat gesagt, die einzige Briefe, wo das Buchständisch waren, waren die in Maori geschrieben. Keiner könnte hier die Wörter verstehen. You don't remember me with a, with a bald head? Sie können seinen Glatzkopf nicht erinnern. Seine Glatzkopf sind Ja, in, sicher. In, in, in. Ich, ich habe ihn ja gesagt, ich kann mich genau noch erinnern. Dann, an, ja, ja. An, an ja, ja, genau. genau. He can er remember you exactly. So, yes. <laughs> good, good. It's very pleasing to get back here. Brings back all the sad memories of um, myself and the other uh, Maori boys, particularly, um, some of whom uh, have now passed on. Um, I think of the times we were together, and all our f other friends, of course. And although at the time I wanted to get out of here, it's nice to be back just once more to have a look at it and bring back memories of those days nearly 50 years ago. With their base established at Mardi near Cairo, the New Zealand soldiers struggled to come to terms with their home for the next two years, the vast North African desert. Men in wide spaces, with nothing in view but the horizon and the blazing sun, is very, very puny and insignificant. And the forces of nature are uh, too great to imagine, and the New Zealand Division passing through a, a strange country 
and strange conditions had to adjust themselves very quickly to the whole scene. They learned one of the truths of war, that actual combat is often a sudden climax to long periods of inactivity, boredom, and endless hard work. Recreation and sports were physically beneficial and good for morale. They did not, however, replace for most a man's home and family. Bully Jackson writing home to his mother. How are you tonight, Mum? Well, I hope. As for me, I am well. That's one thing I can say about myself. But I'm slightly browned off with this life. I want to go home. Strong bonds of friendship, already born of tribal links and deepened by mutual fear and struggle, counted the loneliness and became a powerful spur for the battalion's successes. No soldier could afford to let down his mates, and there was something comforting about being a member of a group with such identity and purpose. For the women at home in New Zealand, the exhilaration of young love had also been interrupted by war. They were lonely partners in marriage, often faced with offspring who had never known a father's caress. Let's hope that I'll be home soon and may all your worries about me be over, and no needs too. It seems as though the biggest thrill of my life waiting for me at home, little Derna. She must be a hard case, all right. Does she suck a thumb, Mum? So it's good night. Love to all, Mary, Irwin, Kathy, Ty, Dad, and the same many times to yourself. May we all meet again soon. Have some muscles ready, Mum. Your loving son, Bully. Everything was fear. When you went into action, it was uh, all fear. I mean, you had uh, fear of being uh, wounded, fear of being maimed, fear of being killed, uh, fear of uh, letting your troops down, uh, your side down, fear of uh, being defeated. It's just one... Uh, one whole uh, mass of fears. It's only when you are uh, given notice that you are going to do a certain attack, you have fear, right? I mean, uh, I, I just can't understand anybody now not having fear. But there are so many things you have to do prior to that attack, you forget about fear. You forget it. And uh, by the time you get to the start line and you're ready to attack, you lost, absolutely lost as far as fear is concerned. You concentrate on what you have to do after that. With the result, you do the job without worrying. You do worry, but you keep on going. You know, you feel sorry for our officer, for the Murray officers, while the soldiers are crawling on the ground, you know. They expect the officer to stand. He's supposed to be extra. And I used to admire these fellas, keeping the morale. Yeah. And those who are leading the Murray Battalion, they have to. They have to, to boost their men up going, going forward. Destroying the enemy is a reality of war. When the killing happened at long range, it could be very impersonal. The delivery of death at close range was not so easy. My two subordinates and myself went down some uh, stairway into a concrete air raid shelter. And in the shelter was a German officer and two Italians. And as I stepped off the last um, uh, step of this stairway, 
um, I noticed that the Italian, who had his hands up, and they all had their hands up in a camarade position, uh, had a, a red object in his hand. Um, I knew immediately that it was an Italian grenade. They painted all their grenades red for some reason or other. And so I had to shoot the three of them uh, with a Tommy gun. And uh, that was my first introduction to, um, to killing, as, as we put it. And it was rather, it was very sad, actually, a sad moment, um, because uh, I went through his, the captain's um, belongings and uh, personal effects and um, found a picture of himself and his three lovely children. And uh, this was a very traumatic moment for me because one relates, one soldier relates to another. At the beginning of the desert campaign, the Germans seemed certain to overwhelm the Allies. Rommel's progress was hampered by difficulties with supplies and was finally arrested at Al Alamein when they were forced to retreat. Individual stories of heroism abound. At Mitarea Ridge, stretcher bearer Corporal James Pidihi braved intense shell fire to tend to the wounded and bury the dead. Once in the face of enemy machine gun fire, he dressed the wounds of a German soldier and carried him to safety. At Gazala, Private Charlie Shelford saved his encircled platoon. He ran 300 yards toward an enemy machine gun post, shooting from the hip. Despite taking shrapnel from three grenades and having his own gun smashed, he grenaded the enemy position and began the collapse of resistance in that area. From the Libyan campaign onwards, Mr. Charles Bennett, a Pakeha civilian, was in charge of Tero Aroha, a mobile canteen given by the Maori children of New Zealand. Charlie Y.M. drove the beloved van in the fiercest of battles to keep the men supplied with cigarettes, sweets, razors and other goods from home. We have for El Alamein have we Maori soldiers gefangen genommen. Das waren gute Kämpfer, das wussten wir von der Infanterie. Ich war nicht Infanterie, ich war Panzeraufklärung im Spähwagen und äh, wir haben das gewusst von der Infanterie, dass sie sehr harte, gute Leute waren. Ja, das waren schon tapfer Soldaten und wie gesagt gut ausgebildet. Den Minen, das war immer ein teuflisches Geschäft, mit Minen zu arbeiten. Sie müssten so gut ausgebildet gewesen sein, dass denen nie was passiert ist. Manchmal ging doch eine Mine hoch beim Verlegen, wenn man ein Zünder kam oder irgendetwas. Und die Maoris haben die Minen da ausgegraben, noch auf die Seite gelegt, ohne irgendwie anzugreifen. Entweder war das eine Art Sport oder war das, wollten sie uns ärgern oder irgendetwas. Auf alle Fälle ist an sich gar nichts passiert, kein Angriff von Maori, sondern nur die Minen ausgegraben, auf die Seite gelegt und am Morgen waren sie wieder weg. The push northwards to meet the first army in Tunisia continued. When a pass was found which would enable the Allies to outflank strong fortifications, the battalion went in. The battle for Tobago Gap started with heavy artillery and air support. Colonel Charles Bennett assigned C Company under Peter Awatere to take a German-held feature point 209. From the base of a hill later called Hikurangi, Lieutenant Mwanangarimu led his platoon straight up the steep rocky slopes. He single-handedly wiped out two enemy strong posts. His kinsman Corporal Wiwi Tenetsi kept two machine gun nests quiet until his men could outflank and destroy them. From only yards away, the Germans charged with their bayonets. They were repulsed. By nightfall, Awatere and Ngarimu were both wounded. They refused to seek attention and held back repeated bayonet charges. Only when his wounds reduced him to crawling about did Awatere agree to get medical assistance. Ngarimu stayed. Throughout the night, he kept his men awake and alert for continual German attacks. Each time they were driven back by bullet, bayonet, and even stones used as makeshift grenades. On and on the battle went. Both sides were mauled by horrific casualties. Through the carnage, Ngarimu exhorted his men to greater effort. At daybreak, he was killed during an advance, his body falling on top of those he had just shot. The German casualties became insupportable. Appeals from them for medical aid signaled the beginning of the end of the battle. Ngarimu's leadership and bravery inspired Colonel Bennett to recommend him for the Victoria Cross. 
took him back to the uh, to the cemetery, already prepared, and laid him to rest there. Well, <clears throat> you know, it's a sad occasion when you spend um, um, all, all night fighting and, um, uh, and then you have to turn around and bury your comrades. It's, uh, it's, um, and looking back on it, uh, I still get very emotional about it. <clears throat> it's a thing that uh, I'll never forget. And uh, I don't think uh, any soldier who served uh, over here overseas will ever forget the war. A lot of people think, say that the war is over. It's been over nearly 50 years, but to a soldier, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it'll be there always. You can't take that away from him, from them. And uh, being back here, I can see uh, <clears throat> all the, uh, the battle in, in operation. The dive bombers, um, and um, <clears throat> especially remember the pilots that uh, failed to pull out of their dive and go crashing into the hills across the way there. And then the uh, <clears throat> tanks and the infantry riding on the tanks and the infantry falling off as they're being shot at from from the uh, Germans. All those things, even and our own chaps going into the shells and um, chaps uh, wounded. And you never forget those things. The next engagement was at Tekruna. During this battle, 12 out of 17 officers were casualties, including Colonel Bennett. New leaders and tactics had to be found quickly. Well, there is confusion, all right, but uh, at the same time, every man uh, attacking would try and get into position as best they can. And it is very difficult, but in the main, we seem to get to our objective altogether. And that was the main thing about it. But on in this instance, the Takruna hill up here was a big obstacle. We were in the Bukhara, and the Arjai were in the Yard, and the Kaaba was in the Hay. They were in the Hay, they were in the Hay, they were in the Hay. And they were in the Hay. 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 أيه كيف يادهم علينا ال المان الإنجليز بخر التالي والمان حبس حدان وتش كنت تعمل لك الوقت هذا أنتي بفطورنا أخي أنتي بفطورنا والله العظيم فطورنا رأس بالليه هذه كتوك والمان منها والمان شد هناي نحن جينا في الوسط هربنا ما بذرنا ما ذرناش أما مرتاح ورانا مرتاح وقدامنا ونحن نجار وعربي بلاد كل هذا مش كناي Takruna was a massive rock edifice which dominated the surrounding countryside. The Italians and Germans intended to hold it at all costs. B Company's part in the assault involved Sergeants Manahi and Rogers. With about a half a dozen men each, they fought their way up Takruna's awesome sheer face. They took the village on top, but the enemy soon counterattacked. Manahi climbed back down and returned with reinforcements. There was a desperate battle. Soldiers were shot, bayoneted, and pushed over the cliff. For two days, Takruna was hidden in the haze of battle. Its capture by the battalion caused England's General Horrocks to remark that it was the most gallant feat of arms he had witnessed during the war. Decorations highlight individual heroism, but hide the fact that the Maori battalion always fought as one, becoming a startlingly effective fighting unit. In the Maori battalion, all the men we had were nothing but the best. They were second to none. And uh, whatever decorations the officers have in the Maori battalion belong to the men, to the battalion, the battalion as a whole. I wouldn't have, if I was a man that age and 
it was voluntary, I wouldn't have joined it. I see when it gets mentioned that I can see the hurt in Nanny's eyes and I feel sorry for her and I have to think, just like every other company, C Company was just like every other company. Um, and I know it's got uh, it's had the highest casualty number. Most people were wounded. It just makes me wonder why they joined and so many of them died, they were so young. I have to wonder why they joined. It's what gets me the most why they joined, it was voluntary. Why they joined. Yeah,モリオラ。書いてといてこらは。テルアタカウ。テイワ。テアナマヒアマイタフィティ。イロトイタマラマカウファンガ。マオノ。オタタウマリ。ないフィリアアラギタタウウルオラタマテンガナタウルラギタマロトトゥランガロトタマリコンマタオテラギオトワカタプ Ruata kau mawaru. Haere, haere, haere. Haere i runga i te whakahere nui ka ore aroha te tahi. I rahi e ki tēni. Ara ke tuku tangati yai anno. Ke mat mona hoa. Ngā mau ngā tapu. O kirihi. O kiriti. Oi hipa, o tuna hira, itari, ngā maunga whakamātanga ki a koutou, me te whakapanota ngā kau, koutou, ngā koutou i whakapai bihuarahi, puta mai mātau i te riwa, i te tū i runga, te ruatakau, Te iwa, haere, haere, haere. Ko te whakataua ki a hopa, kāri mei mori e mai tātou i tēni ao, he mea mārama nō tēni. E kore a he te mai tātou te tahi mea. Nā i hoa i homai, nā i hoa i tango, ke waka painga te ingoa i hoa. Ka ki te azi ki a koutou, Ki a koutou, ngā tama toa atu matawenga. Ko ta taingi tēni a te iwi Māori mō koutou. Ko ta mō tēa tēa tēni a te iwi Māori mō koutou. Tō koutou hinganga he hatonu. A kua kua ma te koutou, tēni te kōrero. E te atua kaharawa A te whaitia manakitia Ngā tainui parikarangaranga 
In Italy, mountainous country made progress difficult. It was a war of attrition. The victor would be the side who inflicted the most casualties. At Pascuccio, Corporal Henry Barrett scaled a cliff and destroyed a machine gun post. His men then fixed bayonets and wiped out other positions. Barrett himself killed nine Germans. Captain Monte Wikilifi displayed magnificent leadership and tactics at Cassino before being severely wounded. He refused to imperil his men by being carried out. With shattered legs, he dragged himself along the ground under fire for 15 hours to safety. For two days on the outskirts of Popiano, under very heavy shell fire, Captain Tomwana ran between platoons rallying and urging them on until the enemy tanks and infantry withdrew. On 4th of August, 1944, the liberation of Florence. Our interest to Florence was exciting and I was with Colonel Lovatere. And we were on the jeep and uh, it was a sort of a competition between the 23rd Battalion and the 28th Battalion to enter Florence. And he came over the air for the battalion to take cover. Just came over. And we took cover and then they rained the place with shelling. And I was an eyewitness to many, many of the people who came out to meet us. Die, children, women. But none of us got killed there because we understood it and we took cover. The Mari soldiers and the Italian people rapidly acquired a liking for each other. They found much in common with communal lifestyles and a joint love of song. The Māori proved adept at learning the languages of whichever country they found themselves in. The Māori language, too, became a code which could not be broken by German intelligence. In Italy, there was humorous confusion over the Māori habit of greeting the locals. The Māori, Chiora, sounded very similar to the Italian for, what's the time? When a woman said, but these Māori are the ones who say that I'm the son, I'm the son. <laughs> no, it was a man, uh, two men, two, two Italian old men. Uh, the, a, a Maori passed from there. Chiara, Chiara! And so the, the one man said, Oh, it's nine o'clock. <laughs> After five minutes, he came back. Chiara, Chiara! I told you it's nine o'clock, but now it's nine, <laughs> five past nine. Bye. Bye.
sorting out the wounded, then we came across this, this area where a Parker fella was under a, a, a carrier. And so my, my rabbit said to me, Padre, we got three minutes, three minutes, and we must get out of this place. So the grab thing, I grabbed something, it looked like an axe to me anyway. So I just grabbed hold of it and cut his leg off and threw him on the, on the, on the, under the jeep. And when no sooner we pulled out, down came the, uh, the shelling. So we got over. Then Robert, he said to me, Ewa, you know that A company language? And uh, I said, yes. We nearly died, eh? <laughs> However, and far as I was concerned, I think there was no hope for this fella because he was, was bleeding and I think like that. And I, I never, never come across him till many, many, many years after I was taken in Enzac in Waitara. And who should turn up was well, this fella. I did know him. And he just said to me, hey, or introduce his wife. This is the man that saved me. That's it. And when he mentioned fire, as soon as he said the crossroad, off I went and just told the story. I said, well, I'm glad that uh, we're back. And, uh, but many experiences like that took place, because never. And then when you had to tie up, look, the, the fellowship or the brotherhood in the, in the, in the park in Maori was just so, just so. This gig is for the Maori Battalion, and to her new owner, she shows an almost dog-like devotion. Bringing home the wine is a responsible job. The first step in turning pig into pork, and for the onlookers, quite a cheering sight. After weeks and months on tin bully beef, this is certainly a sight worth watching. Tomorrow will be a lovely day. The classically beautiful city of Florence was a warm host to the Maori Battalion, as were its citizens. Fighting in the desert had not generally affected the local populations. In Italy, however, the presence of so many people living in and around the battlegrounds meant difficulty for the soldiers and danger for the innocent. The Maori soldiers had a belief in their ability to fight, as well as a deep belief in God and the hereafter. The five padres who served with the battalion were vital to the men's morale. You got plenty of belts to sell. Yes, yeah. good prices for you. It's good? Yes. Discount? Sure. 10% discount today. Oh, that's very good. Because it's cloudy. It's cloudy. Yeah. At the age of 26, we Huata was in the front line, comforting the wounded and ministering to the dead. War forced him to redefine his faith. Do you like this place? Sure. It's fun. Very good. It's fun to send to people. My stuff have six months guarantee. Guarantee. <laughs> I was quite clear in my mind to destroy the enemy, so I prayed that way. And I firmly believe that uh, the Maori Battalion should go home alive. And so my prayers went that way. Destroy the enemy so that we could get, get, get home to New Zealand quickly and everybody alive. And so when the fellow used to say to me, hey, Padre, what about that part that's on that kill? I said, oh, don't worry about that too much. I said, it's either you or him. We were always prepared spiritually, and when we went into battle, <clears throat> we felt we had somebody watching over us. And, uh, and when we came up against the enemy, well, it was either him or us. And I'm sure he felt the same way about it. Uh, that was the story behind it. And without that uh, spiritual uh, uh, build up before we, and if we ever went into battle without it, oh, well, we felt, we felt uh, there was something wrong. Yeah. Uh, we weren't the same, uh, same troops. That's how I felt it, and I'm sure the boys felt the same way. Well, although I was behind um, barbed wire at that time, and I wasn't with you fellas, my prayers were always for you and the battalion to get home safely, um, whatever happens. 
The Benedictine monastery, founded in 529 AD, overlooked the township of Cassino. It was thought to contain German snipers. In one of the most remembered but also futile decisions of the Italian campaign, this sacred place of God was delivered of 600 tons of high explosives. Before their attack on the Cassino railway station, the Māori soldiers of A and B companies gathered together in the warm dusk of a beautiful day. They attended to personal matters. Some wrote letters, while others cleared their pockets in case of capture. When the Padre arrived, there was a feeling amongst the two companies that this battle was going to be tough. They were not to know that of 200 men, only 70 would return to fight again. The Padre called them to prayer and said, Father, look down upon us this moment. Help us to do that which we have to do. Tonight, take those that you want. Tomorrow, let us weep those that are left. Through thy Son, Jesus Christ, let us go on.